Now, let's talk with Ibu Patel. One of the most striking pieces of your story, which was so moving, was the sense that uh, syncretism, that kind mm -hmm. of blending or least common denominator way for us to look mm -hmm. at religion, may not be, in fact, the most healing or whole way for us to approach it. That somehow claiming your mm -hmm. own faith was the way forward. I, I think that's exactly right. And, and if I look at my life, I've had the blessing of that message through mentors at every stage. So that was what Brother Wayne taught me as a Catholic monk who had taken and was very serious about his vows. He was Catholic. Those were his roots. That was his commitment. He admired and learned from Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam. But it was clear he was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Dalai Lama is not confused about who he is, what tradition he belongs to. So these people modeled a way for me. And when it finally clicked, and it took me longer than perhaps it takes most people, that it's about being a Muslim who is living a Muslim life in a world of diversity. Mm -hmm. My goal is to be enriched by that diversity and in turn to serve and enrich it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, Ibu? Since 9-11, there's so much misunderstanding about Islam mm -hmm. and so much fear. And you heard it in Cyrus' story how people threw stones at her and mocked mm -hmm. her because there's so much confusion. What do you think is the most effective way for us as religious mm -hmm. leaders and for our audience listening to change the narrative into a positive narrative? What right. can we tell people post 9-11? Well, thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Rabbi Hirsch. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I really wish that people's first encounter with Islam was with my grandmother no, and not yeah. with Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Right. Right. So my concern is that for millions of Americans, for hundreds of millions of people around the world, the first time they thought seriously yeah. about Islam was on September 11, 2001. Mm -hmm. And their, their vacuum of knowledge about what a Muslim was or what Islam is was filled by an unbelievably heinous, murderous, hateful act. Mm -hmm. I think what, what people can do is to tell stories of people they know, um, stories that they admire, stories like my grandmother's, and say, this is what a Muslim is. Mm -hmm. What Osama bin Laden did is antithetical to the tradition of Islam. Mm -hmm. He's not a Muslim. He's an extremist. Let me tell you about a Muslim that I know or that I've heard of. I, and I, I try to do the same thing when it comes to people from other religions. I think we are, in a way, all responsible for holding up the best in other religious mm -hmm. traditions and in Absolutely. other religious communities. There's a great line about that in Judaism, that we're all responsible for one another, and that mm -hmm. isn't just Jews, but everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. And how, how else are we going to make it on planet Earth unless we're responsible for one Absolutely. another? There's also a sense in Christianity right now, at least those of us in the main line, um, have ceded the conversation to those who are uh, more adamant mm -hmm. about their views. And so our silence is deafening. Mm -hmm. So as I think about Islam, mm -hmm. what would be um, a message you would give about what Islam is about right. in addition to your grandmother's that's, story? That's a great, great point. Well, one of the things that I say is the most common prayer in Islam is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Right? It's what you begin meals with, it's what you begin every prayer with, and it means in the name of God, the all-merciful, the ever-merciful. Mm. The dominant value in Islam, the central value is mercy, mm. and it's expressed in that prayer, it's expressed many times in the Holy Quran. In fact, there's one verse that said, that in which God says, we sent the prophet Muhammad to be nothing but a special mercy upon all the worlds. Mm, it reminds me so much of, um, of the call of Abraham, who right. is sent to be a blessing. Right. Absolutely, and also that right. God acts with a measure of mercy and a measure of deen, which is mm -hmm. judgment, that we sort mm -hmm. of carry this balance, but always the tip of mercy is just a little bit right. stronger. And that's, that's the exact message in Islam, mm. that, right. there is, that there is judgment and there is mercy but God's mercy overcomes his judgment as a Quranic line. So you work with a lot of youth. What I see a lot of youth becoming more traditional, turning back to their own mm -hmm. faith and feeling more closed mm -hmm. in. What do you say to them and to open them up and to get them more excited about exploring but without feeling threatened? Right, well, uh, 
First of all, I, I think that religion is going to play a major role in the 21st century. Absolutely. And there are a variety of ways that religion can go. Religion can be a bubble that isolates us. Right. Religion can be a barrier that divides us. Mm -hmm. Religion can be a bomb that destroys us. Mm. Religion can be a bridge mm -hmm. to understanding and cooperation. I personally believe that young people can play a really powerful role as bridge builders. They can also play a powerful role as barrier builders or as bomb throwers. Mm -hmm. right? I think one of the things that religious leaders can do, um, uh, old uh, adults in religious traditions, is to talk about what I call a theology of cooperation. Mm -hmm. There's a theology of justice in our different traditions. There's a theology of service. There's a theology of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Do the young people in your church or synagogue or mosque, do they know the theology of cooperation? If you were to say to them, what in your religion inspires you to cooperate with those who are different? Mm -hmm. Would they be able to cite chapter and verse? No, because they don't even speak that language. And I think that's what you're saying. We have to right. make that part of our parlance. Right, and, and, and I personally believe it in my own understanding of Islam and in my appreciative study of other traditions is that it's, this is not a hidden value. Mm -hmm. This is highly salient. Right. This is a central value. Uh, in the Holy Quran, there's a line that God made us different nations and tribes that we may come to know one another. Mm -hmm. There are many, many stories of the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, how he engaged respectfully, admiringly in some ways, with people from other religions. But part of the key to cooperation is having a sense of identity for oneself. I'm struck by so many of our young people in, um, in the suburbs of Chicago still who have a cursory understanding of their own faith and who, have kind of, who kind of drop off from it at some point. And maybe it's later in college or maybe it's later after that. And, and sometimes there's a liminal moment, yeah. something that shifts and you think, maybe I need to change this and right. look deeper into myself. That's right. And, and one of the questions I have in, in your experience mm -hmm. is how that has happened. How right. do we help not only young people, but right. older adults as well, reconnect with that right. identity? So I, I uh, am aware that I'm talking to uh, a, a pulpit preacher and uh, somebody who left the pulpit very recently, but may return. And so I'm speaking with two leaders in, in, in religious traditions. And one of the things that I recognize in my own tradition, just tell you my experience here, is when I rediscovered Islam through Brother Wayne and my friend Kevin, who's Jewish, and the Dalai Lama. Uh, and I started to read um, about the Zahaka, compassionate justice mm -hmm. in Islam. I started to read in Rumi. I started to read the mercy chapters in the Quran. Part of my response was, why didn't anybody tell me about uh -huh. this? Mm -hmm. right? I belong to a magnificent faith. And I was just at the Montreat Conference Center yes. with 850 mm -hmm. Uh, young Presbyterian college students, and the thing that I told them was, you belong to a magnificent faith. Mm -hmm. Discover the magnificence in it. That's right? great. And, and to the idea of faith being exciting and relevant, that's what young people want. Mm -hmm. right? The faith hero, the heroes of the 20th century were people of faith. Right. Nelson Mandela, right? a Methodist and an African traditionalist. Martin Luther King Jr. Baptists from the South, Abraham Joshua Heschel, the Dalai Lama, Mahatma Gandhi, Dorothy Day, Jane Adams, the list goes on and on and on. Right? Mm -hmm. We need to view young people as the next faith heroes and raise them up as such. Mm -hmm. So your grandmother found her calling and did it for, I assume she's still doing it, God willing. <laughs> Have you found yours? I, I think so, uh, absolutely. I think for me, uh, building the Interfaith Youth Corps is what I was meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, I personally feel that, uh, that the opportunities to make a real difference don't come along every day. And I feel like I have been blessed with the opportunity to try to help nurture a movement in which young people are interfaith bridge builders in a world in which a lot of other people are nurturing young people to be bomb throwers and barrier builders. You've been it's blessed, but... So have we, I was thinking. That's exactly right, that's exactly right. And as we've been blessed, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, how it's not just for young people, but any time in a person's life mm -hmm. that they can start claiming mm -hmm. that reality for themselves, mm -hmm. it is never too late. And sometimes that liminal moment is when you're young 
and sometimes mm -hmm. it's a little older. Whenever it happens, it's crucial that we pay attention to that voice.